Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to the public panel of the 2021 Sustainability and Energy Expo. Before we begin, uh, we would like to offer a land acknowledgement. Those of us gathering virtually from Minnesota Makoche occupy the rightful lands of Indigenous nations, including Dakota, Lakota, and Ojibwe peoples, as does the rest of the University of Minnesota system. Minnesota Makoche holds special meanings, historical, spiritual, and personal, to Indigenous people who are the traditional and present stewards of this land, having lived here since time immemorial. We affirm and commit to advocating for the sovereignty of these nations on land on which we virtually gather and beyond, and to hold our institutions accountable to Native peoples. We also commit to educating ourselves, as we are today, and others to better understand Indigenous rights, cultures, and lifeways towards a more sustainable and harmonious society. And just as a reminder, many of the names of the places that we uh, occupy today, including Minnesota, Minnesota, um, come from Dakota language. And so part of our responsibility to be able to connect to this place comes from learning more of the history and about the culture uh, of the people on whose land we, we occupy. So to introduce our first panelist of the day, uh, we have Dr. Waziata Wing, who's from the Wakaytuwong Dakota, from the Kajim Tazizi, uh, or Otumwe, or Yellow Medicine Village in uh, northern Minnesota. She received her, or Southwestern Minnesota, she received her PhD in American History from Cornell University in 2000, and earned tenure as an associate professorship in the History Department at Arizona State University, where she taught for seven years. Moziata Wing currently holds the Indigenous Peoples Research Chair in the Indigenous Governance Program at the University of Victoria. Her interests include projects centering on Indigenous decolonization strategies, such as truth-telling, reparative justice, Indigenous women and resistance, the recovery of Indigenous knowledge, and the development of liberation ideology in, in Indigenous communities. She is also the author and editor of five volumes, which you can see listed here. Bida Maya Waziata Wing for joining us today. I will now hand it over to Olivia to introduce our next panelist. All right, our next panelist is Miss Diane Wilson. Um, Diane Wilson is a Dakota writer, speaker, and educator who has published two award-winning books, as well as essays in numerous publications. Her new novel, The Seed Keeper, was published by Milkweed Editions in March 2021. Wilson's memoir, Spirit Car, Journey to Take a Dakota Past, won a 2006 Minnesota Book Award and was selected for the 2012 One Minneapolis, One Read program. Her 2011 nonfiction book, Beloved Child, A Dakota Way of Life, was awarded the 2012 Barbara Sudler Award from History Colorado. Her essays have been featured in many publications, including the 2016 anthology, A Good Time for the Truth. Wilson has received awards from the Bush Foundation, Jerome Foundation, the Minnesota State Arts Award, as well as a 50 over 50 Community Leadership Award from Paul and Midwest. Wilson is the Executive Director for the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, a national coalition of tribes and organizations working to create sovereign food systems for Native people. Wilson is a Mitawakatan descendant enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation. All right, Biche. Next, we have Dr. Marie Schaefer, who is a postdoctoral research associate at uh, Michigan State University. Dr. Schaefer is a founding member and now advisory council member of the Northeast Indigenous Climate Resilience Network, which convenes Indigenous nations and partners across the Midwest and the Northeastern United States to engage in climate adaptation, planning, and action. Dr. Schaefer received her PhD in community sustainability from MSU in 2020. Dr. Schaefer's dissertation used an indigenous community-based participatory approach uh, to explore the impacts of settler colonialism on nomen or wild rice food systems, including how shifts in Anishinaabe and Menominee gender roles are impacting a group of indigenous women today and how those women created a regenerative space to mitigate those changes. During her PhD, Dr. Schaefer worked as a research assistant at the Sustainable Development Institute at the College of Menominee Nation, where she was responsible for coordinating research um, the Institute conducted related to climate change, which included conducting climate change scenario planning workshops with tribes across the United States Geological Survey or USGS's Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. 
Dr. Schaefer received a Master of Arts in Applied Anthropology from Northern Arizona University, where she worked for the Hopi Tribes Cultural Preservation Office and also received a Bachelor in Science in Anthropology from Eastern Michigan University. Thank you, Miigwech, for joining us, and I'll hand it over to Olivia to introduce our final panelist. All right. Um... Ms. Leo Fushi received a Bachelor of Science degree, the social and the cultural factors affecting human and natural resource management from the University of Minnesota in 1990. She was awarded the Jean Day W. Buchta Merit Award for outstanding academic achievement and graduated with honors. Her lifelong community actors were activist work informed her self-designed degree on the linkage between energy development, social strife, economic disparity, environmental contamination, and the resulting disproportionate impacts on indigenous peoples, other people of color, and economically disadvantaged people. Ms. Fushi is environmental justice director for the North American Water Office, which she co-founded in 1982. The foundational concept um, the water uh, for the water office is water for life. NAWO has addressed acid rain, methyl mercury contamination, high level nuclear waste storage, power lines, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and food sovereignty. Ms. Fushi also co authored with Brene Gurnow the bilingual educational curriculum, Sacred Water, featuring the spiritual teachings of the Three Fires, Mide Win Win Lodge, tribal interviews, and food medicines. Ms. Fushi was appointed to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's Environmental Justice Advisory Group in 2016. Um, she resigned in protest along with 11 other EJAG members in November of 2020 after the commissioner approved the Enbridge Line 3 pipeline permit. Thank you for being here. Thank you all of, to all of the panelists. Um, I'll now briefly introduce myself in Dakota Yapi. I'm Bintu Washtedo, Vijay Emakiapi, Bide Ota Ed Wonuspe, Chikankunk Ed Emantumpi, Ka Imachahe, Zani Washtedo. My name is Vijay. I study here in Minneapolis. Um, I was born in Chicago and uh, grew up there as well. And I want to wish you all good health and thank you all for being here. Um, I was raised on the lands of the Niswe Mishko Dewanan, uh, or the Three Fires Council of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Bodewadmi peoples, as well as the shared land of the Illinois Confederation, Illinois, Miami, and many other peoples who came to that area for trade. And I'll hand it over to Olivia. All right. Um, I will introduce myself today in Ojibwe Bowen. Ojo. Olivia Nindiznikaz, Kakabakong Nindonaki, Besho Shade Zagaigon, Nindunjaba, Nimbagose Nima, Gemono Bimadis. Hi, my name is Olivia. I live in Minneapolis and I come from near Pelican Lake. Um, I hope you all are in good health. Chimigwech, um, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, and I guess I'll, oh, you can keep going. My apologies, Olivia, go ahead. I guess I'll just say what's on the screen here too. Um, I am studying environmental engineering at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I grew up on the lands of Dakota, Lakota and Ojibwe peoples. Um, and I've had some time in my summers working with um, the writer, worth, right, White Earth Reservation community. Awesome. Thank you, Olivia. And just to explain a little bit about us as Human Energy Club, both Olivia and I are members. Um, our ongoing mission uh, is to connect different conversations in the sustainability space. And historically, conversations among BIPOC and especially Indigenous communities have not been in highlighted enough in this work. And so we've made an active effort this year, especially in the time of the pandemic, without being able to do our normal technical projects to feature more of these voices. So um, this semester and also last semester, we've heard from a number of folks who have talked about the importance of shared relations, community, and just the importance of understanding our history in order to be able to move forward with this work in a just and equitable way. Um, and so these are just a, a couple of uh, screenshots so that you can, um, you can also see all of these meeting recordings on our website, uh, which I can share in the chat later. Um, 
among other things, we also have, in addition to having speakers come in, um, we have sus chats where um, different students, uh, including myself, have shared some of our own experiences. And so I've tried to share what I've learned from a couple of instructors. Um, in this case, uh, these are things that were taught to me by Jante Suta, Francis Bedayun, Jante Mazanil McKay, and Wabishki Miguan, uh, Mary Hermes. Um, and then this semester, we also started a book club. And so we, we read Braiding Sweetgrass just as a primer uh, to begin to learn about some of these uh, deep cultural issues. And hopefully, um, this will inspire many of you to also continue to go on and read more about this kind of work. Before we begin our questions and panel, um, we just want to settle on some community agreements. Um, first of all, we only want to have one person speaking at a time so that we can give each person um, the uh, respect of our listening. Um, we also um, want to, if we want to meet people where they're at, but don't just leave them there. So if there's something that someone is confused about, we should try to address it in a way that's respectful. Um, if someone does something that is um, potentially uh, offensive or disrespectful, uh, we wanna nicely call them in, um, maybe by using the word oops in the chat, just to alert them that there's something they may have said that could be considered offensive. Um, and uh, ouch, if it's something that uh, is personally uh, problematic. We also wanna make sure that we leave pauses uh, for other people. And in terms of personal stories that are shared here, what's shared here stays here without the explicit permission of the person who's speaking. And what's learned here should leave here. We should try to spread all of the things that we learn to people around us. And if there's one thing we can do, leaning into the discomfort uh, when it is there is super important to this work so that we can all learn and grow. Um, in terms of language that we use, we should use terms that we're specifically asked to use. So um, we can use specific names of a particular nation or community, uh, Anishinaabe, Dakota, et cetera. Um, we can refer to people who are native to this land as from native nations, indigenous. Native American is sometimes not considered acceptable to everybody. Um, and then, so just as, as a note, and then someone who's from Alaska can refer to as, a, as an Alaskan native. And as it relates to this historical term Indian, this usually is used to describe these days people from India and their descendants. Um, however, for use among indigenous communities, it's considered to be uh, an insider term. For example, that's how it's um, considered by Dr. Anton Troyer. Um, and so as we facilitate this space, um, we will default to uh, either native or indigenous to describe these people. Okay, wonderful. Um, thanks very much. We'll go ahead and get started with a couple of our um, a couple of prepared questions. So, obviously, here we are meeting online. You know, I really regret that we aren't able to meet in person and have this conversation in um, the most connected way we could possibly uh, do it. But uh, even so, here we are. And so, I'm curious about you know, in the time of the pandemic, how has this distance and doing stuff online? Uh, impacted your work? And how do you think the return to in-person gatherings will change the way that your work uh, proceeds? For anyone who would like to begin. Zoom calls suck the soul out of your body. I concur. Uh, I first wanted to say miigwech for all the organizers for this. Um, and uh, it's COVID has really, this pandemic has really affected everything that I do. Um, and I'm on this uh, postdoc project. Well, it's larger than just my postdoc, but that's what I'm doing for my postdoc, this uh, Michigan Community Anishinaabe and Renewable Energy um, Project. And the way to build relationships and to actually do this work um, in, any, in any of the communities that we work with or that I'm from is in person. It's really difficult um, to build relationships <laughs> online, um, to ask hard questions, like, you know, online, um, and then uh, things that we would normally do in person. Um, so it, it really has affected everything that that um, 
I do, um, at least. And I really hope that we're going to get to the point of being able to be in person because I think that'll change the way that we're able to build um, relationships with the way that we're able to do the work. Um, I think it'll be richer and deeper and hopefully meet the needs of the communities that we're working with um, at the very least. But yeah, it does. It's and it sucks <laughs> for sure. Honey, Jack, Yuffie. I was in Chanta, was staying up at Cheese Up here. I'm Wazia Tui, and it's with a good heart that I greet all of you with a handshake. Um, I just want to thank you also for the invitation to participate in this discussion. I think it's an important one. Um, I also want to just make a clarification a little bit about my biography um, that was offered at the beginning that's very outdated. I haven't taught it at the University of Victoria since 2013, so at least eight years old, <laughs> and um, things have been, uh, things have shifted dramatically for me since then. Um, you know, I, the work that I'm doing now has really been about Dakota land recovery and the idea of returning people to our homeland through land buyback from settler donations. But once we have those land bases established or reclaimed, um, the hope is that we can bring some of our people home from exile or landless Ocheti Shakoi people can come and we can work on building culturally oriented and sustainable communities. So every day um, sustainability is on my mind. Um, when I think about what I want for the future. For me, it's about being Dakota. And being Dakota means being connected to land and living in the land in, in a good way. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I'm kind of in this transitional phase. And one of the things about the, the pandemic and some of the work that I've been doing, even participating in a conversation like this, is I'm I'm um, I'm so um, I so deeply believe that we have to work towards a, a fossil fuel free future um, like bandana shiva says that we must power down our energy and resource consumption um, and working towards that fossil fuel free future for me has meant examining my own role in the world and the kind of travel i used to do especially as an academic um, to conferences to speaking engagements to gatherings of of different of different people um, I, i've really limited that quite a bit. And actually during the pandemic, the move towards Zoom has allowed me to participate in conversations that I wouldn't use the fossil fuels to go participate in in other circumstances. So in that way, um, you know, I'm, I'm here able to join you today when I probably wouldn't make the drive to the cities for a one hour conversation normally. So Wopidaichichi, thank you. Um, hello, all my relatives. It's it's really an honor to be here today. I really appreciate the the invitation to be part of this event um, and to and especially to have these conversations. Um, I'm personally grateful to Zoom to be able to connect with people. Um, I know it's a, a poor substitute for being in person, but I still. I still enjoy the conversation and hearing your voices, and I especially like seeing your little squares. You know, the webinars to me are a little more isolating, but this way I feel like I'm with you all. Um, and I actually, I work for, well, for the past 15 years, I've been working in um, food sovereignty, food justice um, with two different organizations. And it there have been some real challenges through the pandemic because, um, you know, one of the gifts of food work is that it brings people together. It brings us together on the land, in the fields, but especially when we're cooking and sharing food together and, and learning, learning from the seeds, um, learning the lessons that these plants and animals can teach us. So that part has been difficult. That part has had to shift to programming that's been uh, more on Zoom. And I think for people who work as native chefs, it's been especially challenging. Um, so one of the ways that we've tried to support people through this is just um, 
through programming online, which isn't the same, but so instead of um, getting together, say in a kitchen to cook and share a meal, we had, um, we hosted some chop challenges online so that people would come up with beautiful um, dishes from in indigenous ingredients and then they would post those. And so there was, you know, there was some creative new programming that came out of this, um, which helps in some ways, you know, you shift your, you shift your work from the hands-on experiential to the more, um, conversation, reading, learning based um, um, work. And so there's a place for that too. And, and I hope that we get back to another balance, but I have to also agree with Lizia Tween that for me personally, um, my work has always required a great deal of travel. And um, I live uh, an hour north of the cities and have had to travel a lot to um, for my for my work and also for conferences and and everything else and and what this did was ground me where I live which which has been such a gift because now I'm paying attention every day to what's going on on my own in my own home who are the birds that are returning today who are the plants that have um, that have emerged today. And so there's, to me, a lot of gifts that have come from the pandemic. Um, and I, you know, an event like this, I don't know how much I'd be able to participate if it wasn't for Zoom. So it's a mixed blessing. <laughs> but I understand, Leah, there are days. <laughs> Pidamaya. Um, I definitely, sympathize with all of you guys and your stories. Um, I'm definitely feeling very, very tired of Zoom as, as a student with my classes. Um, but I do, I love being able to see um, the positives that have been coming out of such a dark situation. So thank you so much for sharing um, your perspective on the positives. Um, I'm just gonna jump over to another question here. That's all right. Um, the next question is, how can students from all backgrounds, including those with mostly technical knowledge, um, begin to understand and take action on issues of indigenous and environmental justice? Without earth, there is no heaven. So if you can't take care of the earth, none of your technology will make any bit of difference, not one shred. I live in a solar powered house. I, I, I have solar hot water, but all it has to do is stop working and the well go out and I am out in the middle of the country with no ability to do one single solitary thing. So you have to be concerned about the earth itself, not just the technology and not just the energy. Uh, that's what I think. Along those same lines, I, I'm in total agreement. I think that it's really important for critical self-reflection and it's something that you know, I try to practice thinking really carefully on a daily basis. Um, you know, in Dakota culture, we have really beautiful values, really um, a really beautiful worldview. And we hear people, you know, talk about that worldview all the time, but very few people live it. And so I think part of my struggle or my journey has been how do I start to, to walk the talk? And, and, I, and I, when I say that, it's not from a self-righteous perspective because uh, I'm caught up in this as well. I'm, you know, we're all part of this hopelessly unsustainable society and way of life. Um, but my feeling is that if we don't stop and turn around at some point and try to walk a different path back to sustainable ways of being um, that we will never get there. 
And so um, that's what I've been trying to, to practice in my own life. But, you know, when a, um, one of the things that I often encourage people to do is to examine the underlying values and assumptions that you're making about, about this society and about um, issues like sustainability and technology, um, because, you know, technology is not neutral. Um, anything that requires mining, that requires manufacturing, that requires fossil fuel usage is unsustainable, period. And the only solution, I believe, the only viable path forward are indigenous ways uh, where we um, are not based on extractive economies or uses of finite resources, but instead look at all of creation as relatives um, worthy of respect and dignity and integrity in their own right. Um, and until we, we come to that place, um, we're gonna continue destructive practices. And, and you know, my feeling is that, that we all need to end those practices as soon as possible uh, in order for, um, I guess, most life to survive because we've already done some permanent um, damage. I think one of the challenges of trying to think about how to take action is the overwhelming magnitude of the issues that we're facing. And it's hard to know where to begin. It's hard to know what, what you as one individual can do against what feels like cataclysmic um, environmental issues. Um, but at the same time, I do, I feel like um, one of the places, so for me, when I get into that state of mind, what I try to do is uh, bring it back down local, bring it down, back down to my own backyard and look at, well, what can I do here? What changes can I make right here in the way that I live um, that become more sustainable because we're all a work in progress. So among those changes, one of the, something that we all have some control over is the food that we choose every day. And when you start to look at food from a broader framework beyond just uh, immediate, fulfilling immediate hunger or looking at issues in your community around food that are based from a perspective of are people hungry or not, and you start to look at where does that food come from, who grew it, how was it grown, and what are the consequences of making that food choice. So those trips to McDonald's, you know, because you're busy, so you run through the drive-in or the drive-up window and you, you pick up a bag of food and, and, and realizing that this is very much a cultural statement that you're making about the world that you want to live in because you've you've just chosen the way that meat has been raised and treated in factory conditions you've you've chosen the way that um, if there are vegetables in that bag well potatoes for example the toxic conditions that those potatoes were grown in and then what that's doing in terms of your overall health and these are these are immediate actions and decisions that you have control over and I, these, and I know it's, this is hard work. Hard, changing how you live in the world in relationship to your food is hard work. Um, but it's one of the places that you can make an immediate impact. In, and simply by understanding where that food is coming from and who you just supported in that choice that you made. So that's one of the, just a practical, um, next step that is fairly achievable on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would quickly add, if you want to support Indigenous harvesters and, and folks, then really look at the what you are buying from the grocery store. For example, the manumen or wild rice that you're going to buy from a grocery store, that Uncle Ben's or other companies um, it's grown in California. So start doing some research on understanding why, why that is and why if you try and go find foods, um, indigenous foods in, in your local grocery store in the Great Lakes, um, you know, you start to understand the history of settler colonialism on the landscape um, and why you can't find those foods 
Um, and I would also say if you're a student um, looking at uh, an understanding of if you want to work in this space uh, or understand indigenous knowledge as another, it's a knowledge system. So, um, or another way of thinking of it that some people say is it's another type of science. So the best work <laughs> that I do is in teams. So um, I don't I don't do any any work by myself. Um, uh, so uh, reaching out and understanding. Um, uh, if you want to understand more about indigenous knowledge, environmental justice, start start talking to these people on the panel, but um, that I'm honored to be on. But also uh, other student groups that I'm sure that the, the that this student group works with um, uh, on similar projects and and collaborations. But also thinking about how. Um, some of the best uh, work that I do is not only on a team, but it's a team of people coming from all sorts of disciplines and knowledge systems. So on this MyCares project, uh, where we look at the risks and benefits um, and work with uh, communities and nations on renewable energy, um, we have everybody from engineers to social scientists, um, tribes are at the table making the decisions about how to, how to do this. And that holistic picture that, that by having everybody coming from different places, you're able to have a better um, understanding of what is going on um, and then come up with solutions that make sense for the communities themselves because they're sitting at the table um, themselves. So don't think that you have to go it alone. There are definitely decisions though that you should be making like food and energy, I would argue too. Um, but there are people that are working on these things um, that you can learn learn from and collaborate with and uh, think think a little bit more holistically, uh, a little bit, I would argue, a little Anishinaabe, uh, a little bit more indigenous way of thinking about these issues than, than, um, than maybe you have in your classroom. So, and, and push yourself to do it. Um, it's hard, uh, but if we don't, <laughs> there's some darn, drastic consequences. Um, so yeah, Megwitch, thanks. Can I add to, um, this is an interesting question because it, you know, there's so many bright minds collected here in this conversation and and you're asking such good questions. And, and you know, I'm impressed by the fact that you've also organized into groups and that are topically focused. And you're really trying to grapple with some of the, the these fundamental issues around decisions that you make. And, and one of the places that I um, think about is you're all within the university structure. And what are the ways in which that's now your backyard right now? And how can you, in your time there, impact the university system? When you think about how big it is as an institution, the fact that it's on Dakota land, and what are the choices that the university is making in, in its, uh, as a guest on that land? And, you know, I always look at the lawn. <laughs> is lawn a good choice for that, for that earth? And I'm thinking not and that you could actually be growing a lot of food there or pollinator plants or doing, you know, so these are, these are, this is what I mean by your own backyard. You're at the university, use your clout as students and those, um, this training that you're all receiving to make an impact where you are right now. One of the things you have to be uh, mindful of is the genetic modification of wild rice that the University of Minnesota is just working as hard as they possibly can to put in place so that we buy it instead of the rice from the lakes or hand harvested rice. Um, I think we really need to stop them. They're doing that, they're doing that, mind you, because of the mineral extraction, the sulfide mining for the copper nickel mining, and now they found all sorts of other rare lithium uh, and other rare metals. Uh, and so the mining industry will take out all of it. All the minerals that exist, there's, there's sort of a, a I don't know if you, 
you all are in geology much, but there is a strip across the northern tier of the state that's full of all of that. And it goes right through the wild rice beds, which it, so we won't have any at all. If in fact the university mucks around and, and gets some genetic modified rice that'll grow in sulf, sulfated waters, oh, isn't that tasty. Science is not always the answer. Not always the answer. Excuse me, which, Leah, thank you. Um, this is something, I mean, this is a perfect segue into um, an audience question. Um, Dr. Dockery has mentioned at length um, about the importance of, of our partnerships with other people. Um, and in, in doing that work with the First We Must Consider Monomen project that he and Dr. Mark Belcourt, Belcourt both co-started, um, and uh, Professor Crystal Lang uh, has mentioned, um, she was like, you know, we're, we're doing this work and we want to form a relationship with people, but um, at the same time, as non-Native people ourselves, is it possible for us to, to learn, you know, TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, uh, in a way that's not disrespectful to the culture. And some of the uh, Native folks who were part of that project, they said, well, in order to really engage with this place and to be able to understand Monomen, you kind of have to. Um, and so the, an audience question is, how can Americans, you know, Washichu white people, or even others who are non-Native, and our science, technology, and society incorporate Indigenous viewpoints without appropriating them? So I'm curious about um, what you think about this uh, this thought, uh, incorporate versus holding them alongside each other. I'm, I'm curious to hear what all of your opinions are. I can offer some case examples just, um, uh, but it's usually the, the big picture is you have indigenous people at the table designing it and working with you. And that's, that's how I've been able to do that work. Um, for example, the Menominee Nation has their own sustainable development um, theory. Um, it has an institute based on that theory um, that I got to, the uh, that I was honored to work at, um, and we have a site or we. I used to work there. It feels like I still work with a lot of those people. Um, but uh, it, it was a lot of collaborations, like I talked about earlier, of of working with all sorts of different um, scientists and different people, but owning, I guess, that you aren't an expert on somebody's other worldview and that's okay. Like, but having enough understanding that it needs to be at the table um, and you need to invite people in an appropriate way to, to the table. Um, and in, in our uh, My Cares project, we have a conceptual framework, a way of thinking about uh, renewable energy work that is based on uh, the Nishabe medicine wheel um, that we've worked worked hard um, with our partners. Uh, so those those frameworks, those ways of thinking about sustainability and renewable energy work um, is in collaboration and deep collaboration, not not a stakeholder, not um, you know that kind of where there's some above and equal equal relationships is one way that I've seen it done. Um, and I'm sure others have have seen it done in other ways. Thank you. I just want to say that I'm much more cynical about the capacity to reconcile or bring those two viewpoints together. And uh, I say that because I believe fundamentally Western science is based on a notion of human supremacy and that that humans are superior over all other beings. And so much of the scientific method involves actually destroying what it is or killing what it is um, you're studying. It involves um, dissecting and compartmentalizing and creating conditions that are unnatural, um, changing changing the terms and then trying to trying to understand those things. And I think that that way of knowing is fundamentally harmful. I think it's fundamentally anti-life. And you know, I, I contrast that with indigenous 
ways of knowing, which are largely based on relationship building, understanding that there's a spiritual entity in all of creation. And so if you want to understand something, you ask, you observe, you listen, you watch, um, you use your senses, but in a way that's not destroying what it is you're, you're trying to understand. Um, and so uh, those ways of being, indigenous ways of knowing, have been time tested over thousands of years and they work. Um, they, don't, they don't destroy life. They don't destroy the planet. Um, Western science, I think, is what has gotten us into the mess that we're in. So I don't really look to any answers for West, from Western science. I think, and I think that, that even kind of the framing of the question assumes the legitimacy of Western science and that indigenous knowledge can kind of be incorporated into that. And I, and I think that, that that framework is flawed, um, that it's indigenous knowledge that has been time tested over thousands of years. Western science hasn't learned how to exist without messing everything up. Um, so there's a lot to be learned from indigenous ways of knowing um, and understanding the universe. Um, but they can't be in a supplementary or complementary way. Um, that is the primary way. That is the only pathway forward. Yeah, Maya, Maziatoui, for sharing that. You know, there's one example, um, and uh, Diane, you may have you may have uh, more information or know more examples about this. But um, Dr. Winona Leduc has a uh, there's a couple of TED talks of hers online. And she talks about how Monsanto's corn varieties just absolutely failed under high winds, but um, the Pawnee Eagle corn stood up straight um, and was able to withstand any kind of weather. And because, and she calls them the old guys because they've been around for so long. Was yet doing just like you say they they know this place, um, and so they've adapted to whatever um, the weather does. Um, whereas our limited the limited scope within Western science, again, like you said, can frame things in a way that's inherently negative. And so I'm curious about um, all of your opinions, but in Braiding Sweetgrass, Dr. Kimmerer talks about how um, if there's a, a Western way of knowing or a Western way of, uh, of communicating and of understanding things, I think, I don't remember what language it's from, but she calls it an ilbal, um, of, of knowing that it is Western science if, if there exists one. Um, so, I'm curious about if there's a if there's a place for that, and also um, sort of in relation to food. There's a there's a question I see uh, here in the chat, um, uh, but maybe we can come to that a little bit later. I'm curious. Maybe between the the Western science viewpoint and the indigenous science uh, viewpoint. So I'm not I'm not exactly clear <laughs> what your question was shifting towards, but I I do want to add to the conversation from because um, this is something that I've thought a lot about in terms of um, you know looking at conventional farming these days and how did it and just looking at actually the progression of food relationships. Let's say just here in Minnesota, and when you when you look back in time and you look at um, uh, that traditional, what was a traditional indigenous diet um, several hundred years ago that was based on hunting, gathering, and some cultivated plants, and what that spoke about the relationship to the world around you, and and that was the key to it. That mintaku yewasi, we are all related, meaning if we're related literally to the food that we eat, then we take care of it like a relative. We make sure that we don't over harvest. We make sure that we only accept the gift that is given. And we make sure that we all have enough, that we all survive. But then when you follow the progression of um, how tribes were moved on to um, reservations and then the shift in food in diets to commodity foods, and then how that with the impact that that has had on not only on health, but on that relationship to the plants and animals, it was it, it, it inserted a, a very big disconnect 
in that relationship. And that's where I think that that's one of the impacts that Western science and by extension, Western farming has had is that lack of understanding about as human beings, we are in a relationship with everything around us. And in the and in a conventional farming sense, it's relation, it's a commodity. So it it, it is a that's the fundamental shift to me that has to be made um, in in order to really change the the way that science operates and the impact that it has. And that to me was one of the most beautiful teachings in Robin Wall Kimmerer's book was over and over about that relationship and how, you know, really human beings are on the bottom of the order in terms of other species. And yet Western culture and science puts, as Wazia Tawin said, it puts us on top. And that's a fundamental um, mistake that has had all of these consequences for the world around us. So I just wanted to add that, that thought. All right, um, I can move on to maybe another question here. Um, there's, a question here that I found um, that says, are there any shared values among the West and indigenous cultures that we can go forward together with? Do you guys think? There's three values that I talk to people about. Respect, honesty, and sharing. If you get those three, maybe we got something to talk about. But if, if there's no respect among peoples, if you don't think that we have the same intellectual capacity, um, then we got nothing to say. I've spent so many years of uh, uh, being treated very badly. And I'm sure many of you have been as well. But it's just because of what race you are what color your skin is and they're murdering people in Minneapolis for all of those reasons. If we can't get beyond that, there isn't any hope. We have to find love. If we, if we can't find anything else, we have to find love for all the creatures, for all the living creatures. If there is no love, there will be no survival because we have to help each other. Not all of us know how to grow food. Some of us really know how to grow food. I'm a garlic farmer. But we have to be willing to share as well. What they did to Francis is just really repulsive. I don't know how many of you had ever seen his garden. But he talked about how he was abused all the time. When you go to talk to him, he wouldn't talk to you about plants. He talked 
about how abused he was of how people in the university abused him. Now, it's sad that he decided to not struggle on. Extremely frightening, actually. What? What? Yes. Well, There has to be something that can be done. Money is what they understand. Do any of the other panelists have other comments to share on, on the incident? I would just add, if you look at the history of um, the University of Minnesota and its relationship with tribes in particular about Manuman and how it is directly responsible for the commodification of Manuman and why there is a conference, a symposium where the temp, where the university president has shown up um, every other year um, in order, because the, the tribes in what is now Minnesota, you know, <laughs> called out the university for so many things, why that, that symposium, the Newman symposium has happened and why, um, but just looking into that history, it's not so, it's very, very incredibly disappointing, but not surprising to see um, what happened to Francis and it needs to change. It just needs to change. Um, and that is for the students and faculty and staff that, that at Minnesota that are on right now, um, there are ways to work towards that um, and uh, to keep, keep the pressure on because it's, but looking at that history and understanding the history um, in the 19, was it 1950s, there was a um, conference at Minnesota that created the industry for uh, what is the commodified rice and then how it ended up out in California and the research that made it, made Manuman be able to be grown out in California in a non-shattering variety, et cetera. So is based at the university. So kind of understanding some of those things helps understand the impacts of um, what is going on now. And, uh, and also hopefully some strategies to, that we could work towards mitigating that and changing what is going on. So there are shared values, I believe. Uh, it's difficult though. <laughs> and it's, um, uh, understanding how the disappearances and dilemmas like Kyle White talks about of settler colonialism work um, and work in your own backyard uh, really helps to, to mitigate and to maybe have us come together on some shared values, including I think somebody said in the chat with, with giving land back. That's, that's part of it. Miigwech.
Well, I, I did have such, uh, such high respect for the work that Francis was doing on campus and the fact that you could go and sit in his garden and be surrounded by the plants and know that, that the plants were listening to your conversation. And, and so that all that we are talking about here today was being demonstrated right there in that garden and that the university had a, the, it had the opportunity to learn from Francis. So you have to really look at that. What are the forces that are guiding the decision-making at the university? Uh, when you are talking about sustainability, it means engaging with those forces. And when I was working at um, Dream of Wild Health and you know, we uh, protecting a very, a very precious collection of old indigenous seeds, um, the university was very problematic in terms of being a partner. We were really careful. There were um, two exceptional staff people that we partnered with. But you know, the last time I checked, the university was receiving funding from, I think it was Syngenta. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's one of the, the primary um, genetically modified corporations out there. And, and so, uh, you know, you have to look at where, where is the, where's the money coming from? Because that will tell you a lot about why these decisions are being made. So there's actually a question in the chat that, um, or not in the chat, but in the Slido thing. Um, that kind of goes along with what you were saying, Diane. Um, in what immediate ways do you think governments need to shift towards environmental and social justice, specifically incorporating indigenous ideas? Okay, I think it's problematic to expect government to shift that government is very much invested in doing exactly what it's doing and um, for reasons of power and control. And what I think has to shift are people. So each of us has to make those decisions. And um, I'm a firm believer in grassroots movements and that together that when we, when we each make these individual choices and, and begin to shift the way that we engage with the world and we simply refuse to stop complying, that's when we start to make change because um, we become numerous. We become a, a, a force to reckon with. And I think that's some of how large historical shifts have been made. So, you know, just taking seeds for an example, um, a government solution would be to, to store them, say, in a, a seed bank in Svalbard, um, in, an, in a, a glacier that's melting. And, you know, seeds are living beings. They need to be grown. And so a different approach to a, to a situation like that would be, well, why don't we all grow them then? Why don't we each have seeds in our garden so that if mine get wiped out by hail, uh, maybe Leah's garden um, survives and that way we're we're protecting each other we're protecting the seeds it brings us together as community and then the work grows from there so that's where I feel very um, much more cynical is in expectation that the government is going to be a solution um, to the challenges we're facing I'll just say one of the things that that I am always concerned about when looking at or thinking about what governments might do or, or any entity, um, any project that they take on, on Indigenous land without Indigenous presence is, is inherently problematic. Um, and so, you know, I, I get requests for example, someone will, will want to uh, rename a place. They'll want to use the Dakota name. And in general, I'm very much in favor of that, recovering Dakota place names. But they want to do that for themselves. Um, it's not about 
creating access for Dakota people or giving that that space back to the Dakota people so that we can actually inhabit it or use it. It's about uh, they're making themselves feel better or more liberal or more sensitive um, so that they can use the Dakota name for the place while they're still occupying it. So I think we've got some huge justice issues that uh, need to be worked out first. Um, and so I've just like, when I get requests like that, I just say, are you giving the land back to Dakota people? And if they say no, then I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna help you with the Dakota name for that place. Then um, I'm just, I'm, I'm beyond that now. So, you know, I, I really think that land is, is key um, access for indigenous people, indigenous life, um, plants and animals. Um, we need to think about all of those things and, and give that primacy and importance. <laughs> I guess it sort of gets at the problem of like performative uh, reparations where it's not really actually doing anything substantial. Um, and it just looks like good things are happening and just lip service. So was yet doing thank you for sharing that. Um, with the last couple of minutes that we have here, um, there's kind of two interrelated questions that I'd like to ask. Um, but there was this one video that I watched and granted, I, I don't know um, these people personally, um, but according to um, shamans of the Yawanawa Nation, which is an indigenous nation in uh, the Amazon rainforest, um, they believe that climate change is a symptom of, and this is a quote from a, a video that I saw, a lack of love and understanding in the world, which uh, Leah sort of gets at your point. Um, so how can we connect to others who are afflicted with this, you know, what we might call a disease and how can we also recognize it in ourselves and address it? I'll just say quickly, because this is something I, I wrestle with a lot. And this was part of getting back to the idea of, of walking the talk. And, you know, I and I think that we really do need to address it in ourselves first. And and I one of the things that I was struck by with the the fight or struggle against Apple at Standing Rock um, and, and that concept of mini Wichoni, water is life. And um, of course, I believe that. Of course, that's foundational to, to who we are as Dakota people and indigenous peoples more broadly. But how many of us are living that on a daily basis? And, um, you know, I, I the, my husband and I, we've got this earth lodge, which is a virtual background you see behind me on the Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota, where we live. You know, we don't have any electricity, no running water. And because of that, we're much more conscious about our, our water usage. And, you know, we, um, we think very carefully about our, our washing water for dishes, for bathing, um, for the water that we drink, cook with. Um, and we certainly, um, one of the first things to go when you're living off grid is, is flush toilets. Um, you know, that, that our traditional teachings is you don't defecate in water. And here we are, part of industrial civilization is the careless use of water on a daily basis. And you know, people people take that for granted, um, and we're all a part of it. I mean, we're all a part of industrial civilization. But how that that fundamental teaching, mini wichoni, what does it mean? What does it mean for us as Dakota people, for example, when we defecate in water? Um, how are we putting those things into practice? How are we putting those teachings into practice? And that's just you know one little example, um, and we're you know, and, and I, again, I, I'm not saying this because I'm talking from a self-righteous perspective. I'm talking as someone who's really struggling and wrestling with these things and thinking about how do we walk forward into the future um, in a good way? And how do I think about my actions, what I'm doing um, and take responsibility for that? I guess I would just say um, 
part of it is understanding, um, having that love for not just our human relatives, but also our other um, plant relatives, our animal relatives, our wind relatives. Um, so that that I think is a, a piece of it, um, is, is having that love and that relationship. So this is the Newman behind me from Tawas Lake in Michigan. Um, and uh, that's, that's definitely a relative that I've gotten to know better over the last four or five years as I was able to have a dissertation uh, part of it. Uh, so I think that's, that's part of it, right? It's, it's, it's a disease um, uh, in not having a connection um, uh, to, a, to a place um, and a, a deep understanding of, of that place and, the, and all of the relatives. All right, um, with the last couple of minutes here, um, there is a popular question um, from the audience coming from students and in school right now. Um, how, what are, are there actionable things that we can do now because we want to help. Are there any projects that you are currently working on um, that would benefit any um, any students or volunteers? Well, I will make a quick plea here for help. Um, we're in the process of trying to get legislation passed so that we can build earth lodges in our Minnesota homeland. Um, so earth lodges are one of our traditional structures, but the last time our people regularly lived in earth lodges would have been around the Mille Lacs area of Minnesota around the 1750s or so. And so we're trying to recover this ancient practice with some modern adaptations, but we're in violation of Minnesota state fire and building codes. Right now we're trying to get, we've got um, bills in the, the House and Senate, um, 1042 um, in the House and uh, 1087 in the Senate side. And uh, we're, uh, you can contact Senator Limmer right now and ask him to accept the language from the House bill um, that will be, um, they'll be examining in conference committee. That's where things are. Um, right now, that is on my mind uh, most immediately. That's where we need help. What's the House bill number once again? House file number 1042. And Senate file number 1087. I would say just learn more about your food and energy systems. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, you know, is part of what this whole day I'm sure is about. Um, so understanding better what, what, what is these concepts that we're talking about, about energy sovereignty, for example, or cellular colonialism, how that plays out um, in your own backyard, like was mentioned, um, and then how to start to mitigate those of if you pick up a box of wild rice mix, of Uncle Ben's wild rice mix, that's a me advertising. Um, turn it over, see where it's grown, see who's producing it. Um, uh, just take a, take a take thirty seconds to do that. Um, not even ten seconds to do that type of thing, um, and then start to understand. Uh, you know, for your energy system, uh, you might very well, I can't, as a postdoc, can't afford and can't put on solar panels or do wind energy, but understanding, um, kind of having a personal energy assessment, um, but then also even, you might be able to join a, a solar energy community um, farm. Garden. Uh, yes. Solar yeah. garden. The solar garden. Um, and so there's all sorts of things that you can do individually, um, but it comes, you know, first kind of making that assessment um, and then and understanding what is going on in your own backyard with with things like line, you know, the pipeline three in Michigan, we have uh, line five. Um, 
so so those type of things um, I think would definitely be helpful and there's small things that you can do and large things like supporting that bill but um, yeah just one thing at a time and and keeping keeping your head up um, and aware of what's what is going on and for those people that are in our communities that are dealing with a lot right now um, whatever we can do to to support them while also being okay um, so there is there is a lot of suffering a lot of everything that's going on um, so make sure to take care of yourself in this process um, and uh, and your communities and your family so thank you much. So um, I don't know if any of you know Christine Baumler, who is a, a professor at, yeah, at the U. Um, and she's in, I believe, the arts department. And she, she does really interesting work with, of that overlaps arts with environment. And I know that she's planning a planting of pollinator plants, uh, I think, around the art building in that area, so that you know it's making steps on the at the university towards a more pollinator-friendly environment. And I, you know, I think that's really wonderful, especially in such an urban environment. And you're along the river, so there's a lot. You you actually have a lot of um, bird and insect traffic that can be supported by those pollinator plants. So that's a place where you can get involved in an actual planting. And I always think of those um, volunteer projects along the river where you can pull out buckthorn, you can um, you know, restore uh, native plants. And those are all just small ways, cleaning up trash in the river um, or along your roads, just day-to-day -day stuff, all, it all helps, it all adds up. Yes, um, and so Beth put in the in the chat there about Christine Baumler, um, but she will have that project is coming up yet this spring. So maybe maybe check with her. It's interesting. I just now realized that two of our art professors are some of the leaders in actually doing the embodied, you know, work. That, they don't think of it as work actually, but. Um, Sean Connedy works uh, in the Lake Hiawatha area and just picking up trash and then creating artwork from it. Um, and Chris is got the pollinator um, boxes over by some of the lakes in the Twin Cities now for the solitary bees. But anyway, the Institute of the Environment will definitely promote those opportunities, everyone. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Yeah, do you have any opportunities that students could get involved with the uh, North American Water Office or um, other people you know of connected to the university community? Um, the projects that we're doing are in Northern Minnesota. Replanting berries. The solar garden that I mentioned, that's one of the projects that uh, Community Power is working on, solar gardens. And they are with my husband, George, who works on energy issues. Actually, you should talk to him and not me about energy issues. Awesome. Well, I know we are a little bit over time, so I don't I don't want to overstep too far into awards, but um, Marie, Diane, Leah, Wazieta Wing, Vida Maya, thank you so much for uh, joining us and sharing all of your insights and knowledge with us today. Um, we all really appreciate it. And um, we hope that you all, of course, take care of yourselves as well, um, as this is a very complicated time. So I hope that all of you stay well. Really appreciate it. Thank you again. And I'll hand it over to Beth for awards. Thank you um, to the panelists and to the judges and to um, all of the presenters today. Um, wow, I sometimes Zoom can feel wear, um, wearing, but I just feel like ready to go out and um, get my hands into doing some some work. I tapped my maple trees um, 
this spring and I'm going to share some of the maple syrup with some of our students because we're finally allowed to be together a little bit. Um, so miigwech um, pilomeru for the teaching of how to do that and it's, it, you know, it feels very, very good over the long term to start to do that. And I also just want everyone who's been on this call today to get the books um, that they were shared earlier by Vijay, but get the books, um, follow the writings of the leaders we have here today. Um, and with that, I'm supposed to turn fairly quickly over to announcing some awards and then I'll do a couple more thank yous. Um, and yeah, so we can also have the presenters who are here um, say a word or two. So I just want to start out with like really saying that everyone who is here today, you know, we are the people that we need to see to do the work that's needed and coming to an event like this and sharing and being vulnerable with what you're working on um, is an amazing win. So you are all really truly winners and you are the people we need in the sustainability work. So I really mean that deeply, like <laughs> we're giving out some prizes, but please keep up your work. Um, every presentation I saw, I was in room one, um, was um, incredible, amazing work. Like it's always beyond my expectations. And once again, you know, ideas I'd never heard of. And um, yeah, just the teams that, that have come together, um, new ways of thinking, um, such commitment. It's just um, wonderful. I feel, you know, filled with good hope um, from this event today. Okay, but now I'm gonna announce winners and I'm gonna go um, start with session two. Um, I should back up and say I'm Beth Mercer Taylor. You can see that I uh, have the great privilege to work with our student team in our sustainability education at the Institute on the Environment. Um, and the stu students are really our directors and leaders today, but um, I guess they don't like to have to announce who's getting a prize and who's not. So I'm doing that. So session two. Lightning Talks, um, I'm gonna go to room two. And there were four incredible, amazing presenters and very tight scores together here, but just edging out as the winner from that is Sam Rosemark from University of Minnesota, Morris. And if Sam is here, could, you could um, say a word just for a minute. Yeah, hi all, thank you so much. I'm really thrilled, really appreciative. And I know our Morris model team will really appreciate this award, so thank you. Yay for the Morris model, which we see pictured right there in the background. And you can check out the website if you think, wow, that Morris model one, what's that about? So check it out. Okay, and moving along, we're gonna go to session two to the lightning talks from room one. And again, four entries there. And again, like, like scores of like half a point away from each other. So very, very close. Um, but the big winner for that room is the team of Lita Albrecht and Catherine Tomaska. And if one of them is here, you could say a word for a moment. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> um, I think this will mean a lot to our group. It's been really hard this semester with being partially online. Um, so we were just, if anything, excited to be able to actually do hands-on things in person with this composter. Um, so I'll just stop there for me, but thank you guys so much. It means a lot. Yeah, ditto to everything Lita said. It was such a great opportunity to get to present what we've been working on and having a lot of fun researching and learning about compost. So thank you all. Everyone who didn't get a chance to see this presentation, these are undergraduate students who've basically like invented a new way to compost. I mean, wow. So look to them for more. And if you wanna participate in their trials later, you can keep your eyes open for that. Very cool. Okay, I'm gonna to move to session one. Um, and session one, um, I should have said that these prior winners were all in the lightning talks category. Um, session one um, in room two was creative works and posters. And that is a little bit tricky to do on Zoom. So everyone who participated in that is a winner just for making that format work. Um, but four fantastic presentations, I, again, seriously, like these are like 
two point differences here um, at the end. Um, but drum roll, the winner um, from the College of Design is Franco Garcia. And if Franco is here, if you could say a word. Hi, sorry, the, the lead up to that tension just makes your beat heart, uh, your heart beat so fast. Uh, I'm really glad for winning the award. I thought like coming into this, I was really excited to hear the different perspectives from everyone. I thought um, my project throughout the years, like it's still a prevailing topic that's gonna be more applicable to the future. So I really wanted to get a lot of people's opinions on it because each person's perspective on a project makes all the difference, especially when it ends up impacting all of us in the future. So I'm really glad to be able to participate in this, in this event. Yay, and thank you. Um, and Franco is in a um, long tradition of students from the College of Design have this strong winning streak. I guess it might be their learning in design and communication because um, I think this might be like the whatever 10th year of College of Design students winning at least one of these prizes. So congratulations to the um, sponsoring college and to all the colleges too, but a bit of a streak with um, College of Design. And with that, we're gonna go to, um, we have five prizes to award. We've given out three, so we have a tie. So from the um, session one, lightning talk room one, um, four, again, really tight, um, with the, with the judging, very tight scores, um, but two exact um, tie um, scores, the same between two groups. So um, these are sharing, I think the first prize from room one, Lightning Talks. And first I will do um, George Mason from CFANS. So if George is here, say a word. I'm on mute, but I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, that's humbling. And, and um, we're so happy that we could have uh, contributed to this uh, expo today. So thank you. And I, I think Katie might be here too. Um, yes, I'm here as well. So thank you so much. It was really cool to be able to learn about dual usage solar throughout this project. The dual usage solar is pictured behind George. Um, that's the solar with the flowers. So you can learn more about that one too. This, this is actually my living room. I wish it was anyway. <laughs> I wish it was. It would be nice if it was. But you have a there's a picture somewhere with um of yeah full pollinators and and uh, solar. But um, very exciting project and um, wonderful to see undergraduates doing such um, cutting edge work. And yeah, we hope that will continue. And all of your work will continue. Finally, the last prize for the day goes to, um, I'm gonna give it away, it's a team. So Mei Li Gong, Alex Hawkins, and Nate Twardock, and maybe one or the other of you could say a word. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm. This is totally a surprise, and I'm so grateful to the flexibility of the uh, Sustainability and Energy Expo for letting us kind of slide in, even though we got a later start to our project and weren't able to apply right on time, but so glad for the flexibility on both ends because, yeah, thank you so much. Fantastic. We really appreciate um, all of the participation and um, know that it, this was a hard semester to do this. So, um, you know, kind of extra thanks for making this work in the midst of, um, you know, pandemic and that this week um, with the Dante Wright killing and so much going on in our communities um, coming together in this way, um, we know represents extra effort on your behalf. Um, I want to call out again our sponsors and we saw that in the slides. Uh, maybe um, one of our support staff could share the slides or I could, can I share the slides? Yeah, I think I can actually, hang on, I'll do it. Um, so here's our, here again is our sponsors. We have colleges from across the Twin Cities campus as well as units like the Institute for Advanced Study. And we also have the University of Minnesota at Crookston as a sponsor and the University of Minnesota at Rochester and the Office of Sustainability from the University of Minnesota at Duluth. And of course we have great representation from um, University of Minnesota 
at Morris as always, as well as um, our lead student group, the University of Minnesota Energy Club that you all got to know better today. And then um, in terms of our financial sponsors and also some of our judges, thank you so very much for spending your, your afternoon with us. Um, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce's WasteWise uh, work, which works with businesses on reducing their waste and Evergreen Energy, which works on um, sustainability in energy for communities and businesses. And then um, Tenant. And finally, um, just another reminder, if you liked coming together today, that you can come back together with a lot of folks um, from the Institute on the Environment and Environmental folks across the University of Minnesota to this talk on Monday. Um, and there is the Z link for it at z.umn.edu backslash Terry Root. And Terry Root is a colleague and friend of, of our director of the Institute on the Environment, Dr. Jessica Hellman. And Jessica Hellman is really excited about the conversation that's gonna unfold on Monday. And I also want to just finally thank all of the people that you've seen today that have the term support staff um, on their name. That is the um, student organizing team from both the Energy Club and from the Sustainability Education Office. And this effort took a lot of planning between communicating and recruiting all of you into the event and supporting you with logistics and inviting in the judges and then arranging for the prizes and arranging for our Zoom to work out as slickly as it did. Um, it is a huge lift and effort. Um, it's also a great learning experience. So um, we thank you all for being part of it and thank the student team for really driving um, this event each year and we look forward to continuing it into the future. So yeah, um, thank you um, to everyone. And I think I'll, I'll turn to Vijay for a second to see if there's any other final wrap up. I don't think I have any additional comments. I just wanna thank you all for participating and uh, for sharing your work with us. I know this has been super, super stressful. Uh, I can tell you personally, it's been as well. It's just been a really crazy year seems like time has flown by and stood still all at once. So I want to thank you all for, for sharing your amazing work with us and for putting your heart and soul into doing what we do. So thank you again and hope you all have a great weekend, a great rest of your semester, and looking forward to everything to come in the future and, of course, all of the progress that we have yet to make. So thanks again, everybody. Chi um, Sorry, before we Before we go, can we take a group picture? Thanks for the reminder, Fatima. I'll let you take that over. <laughs> um, actually, like, can someone else volunteer to do that? Yeah, I can take the screenshot. Um, all right. If you are comfortable, please um, turn on, turn on your camera. And all right, smiling. Oh, ready? All right, smiling. Three, two, one. Got it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank Have a you. Weekend. Mm -hmm.